right. Hey, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today with Dr. John Dooliard. Um, He's someone that I deeply admire, and I've learned so much about food from him recently. He is the publisher of a free video newsletter, and it goes out three times a week. And he focuses on proving the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science at lifespa.com. And you'll also find over 500 health videos and self-help articles there, and they are great. I soak them all up. You should, too. He's written six books, produced numerous health DVDs and CDs, and has formulated his own line of organic healthcare products, including Amazing Ghee. And he's the former director of player development for the New Jersey Nets NBA team, and has been a repeat guest on the Dr. Oz Show, and has also been featured in Women's World Magazine, Huffington Post, Yoga Journal, and dozens of other publications. He currently directs the Life Spa Ayurvedic Center in Boulder, Colorado, which is a great place to visit. And he lives there with his wife and six children. So we've been collaborating for um, the beginning. We started collaborating this year on a recipe partnership with Dr. John's newest book, Three Season Diet Challenge. And we're offering 12 months of seasonal guidance and recipes so that you guys can dive into eating seasonally. And we're going to get a little deeper on that topic today. Hmm. Thanks, Emma. And it's great to be here with you. And I want to tell my viewers a little bit about Emma. Uh, she's an amazing um, woman, a, an incredible cook. She was one of the top finalists in the, uh, the Food Network's uh, Food Network show. Uh, she's the author of the book, Frisch Kitchen. She has a blog that you all need to you know, follow at emmafrisch.com. She has over 500 recipes and videos there where you can learn how to cook with Emma. Emma's all about seasonal eating, all about you know, using your CSA and local farmers. She, that's why we're connected in this whole three season diet challenge where you all know that we're putting out this monthly little uh, packet of information about how to eat with the seasons, all the research of the microbes and how they want to eat with the seasons and all that. And Emma took the, the recipes, some of our grocery lists, and tweaked them with her recipes and created these amazing recipes uh, with, the, with the each season, each month of each season in mind, which is just incredible. And, there's over, and she's got over 500 recipes and videos on her website, on her blog. So definitely get her blog at emmafrish.com. It's great. Uh, like I said, she was a top finalist on season 10 of the Food Network show, The Food Network Star. So she's like a superstar. Um, <laughs> And um, she uh, is the director of the, um, the culinary director and co-founder of Firelight Camps. And you got to know about this. This is an incredible thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this today. But I'm a, as I've been talking lately, more about our connection to microbes and how we've kind of lost that connection. And we have this thing called the nature deficiency disorder. Well, Emma and her husband put together these camps where you're in these really super nice tents in the wilderness where she feeds you like five-star food. So you're in the wilderness, chilling in nature, but then you come and eat this amazing food that Emma cooks, right? That's what it is, right? Yeah. It's just incredible. I mean, what an idea. And she's in Ithaca, New York. My son actually went to college there, and, and she's mm -hmm. and this is growing and growing, and hopefully it'll be a, a, na a national thing very soon. So it's really awesome. So you want to check, you know, check that out, out about her. And um, she's just got so much great information for us to, to know about. And... Um, uh, we have a, hopefully a long-term relationship and friendship. And in this interview, I want to interview her a little bit about how she is taking, you know, this seasonal challenge that we're doing, and with the knowledge that she has. And how do we? How does she? How does she make these re re these recipes? How does she blend them together? And what can we learn from Emma about seasonal eating? How to get food from your CSA locally? And how to make this whole process a lot easier? So, welcome, Emma. Thank you for for being a part of this uh, whole challenge and uh, we're honored to have you. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful introduction. I'm kind of blown away and blushing over here. <laughs> but um, I would love to just dive right into some questions that I have for yeah. you around seasonal eating. And um, as we go, maybe we can talk about you know how this ties into your book and the science behind why it's important to eat with the seasons. And then we can explain some of the strategies for finding seasonal food. So, Perfect. well, my first question that I've been dying to ask you all day is, what did you have for lunch? Oh, what did I have for lunch today? <laughs> it's a March day. We're coming up on spring. Well, I had, actually, I had a spinach salad, and I had some veg vegetarian sushi. So that's what I nice. had for lunch today, yeah. That's great. Well, so why is seasonal eating so important? 
you know, what we, here's what we know. We know that plants come out of the ground and we know that they attract, each individual plant attracts different microbes. And we also know that our body, 90% of the cells in our body is microbial. So, and those microbes come from only one place. They come from the dirt. And those, those, those bugs are attracted to certain plants and they climb on these plants and they have this symbiotic relationship, which we're only just beginning to understand that helps feed the plants with nutrition and the plant that the bugs get something from the plant and they love each other. And then, and of course, if you sprayed the plant with anything, you know, like a pesticide, the bugs are dead, right? So that would be bad. So that's what we've been doing is killing our microbes. That's why in the West, we have the, the, the most deficient microbiome of any place on the planet. Our microbes are, you know, devastated. They're sort of monocultured. Um, and, that, and that means we have, if you look at nature, we have three kinds of bugs in our gut. We have good guys, bad guys, and a lot of kind of real estate occupying non-functional microbes. And as we kill all the, the, the good bugs, we end up with a lot of these real estate occupying non, you know, functional microbes. And so hopefully a good amount of good guys and not so good, not so many bad guys. Well, the problem is if you ever got, a, you know, sick or something, the good guys are supposed to take out the bad guys. But if you have a lot of these do nothing real estate occupying bugs, microbes, then basically what happens, we don't have that immune response any longer. And that's, yeah. of course, a bad thing. And the good guys are what we're beginning to understand support blood sugar, bone density, mood, clarity, energy, mm -hmm. vitality. About every physical function that we have is related to the, the beneficial microbes that we have. So why eat with the seasons? Well, the microbes are dr dramatically shifting from season to season to season. I, I, um, I read this book it was called the the forest unseen maybe you've all read it mm. it's a book about this botanist who took one square meter of earth it was in i think virginia and um he just went there every day and watched it his inch his, his square meter inch by inch and checked it out and i guess one day a deer came and ate some of his meter of earth and uh mm -hmm. and he started talking about deer and he said that if deer eat bark in the winter they have microbes to digest bark in the winter and they have microbes to digest leaves in the summer but if the deer were to actually eat bark in the summer, they wouldn't have the microbes to digest the bark. And it would cause such a level of indigestion, it could actually kill the deer. And I was like, uh -huh. you're kidding me, right? That blew my mind. I wrote a book called The Three Season Diet, Eating with the Seasons, back in 2000 that came out. So I've been about seasonal eating for a very long time. But when I read that, I was like, wait a minute. We have no clue that yeah. what, what's in season or out of season. We eat the same food 365 days of the year, and no one even knows that a deer would die if they ate out of season. What does that mean for us? We can just eat whatever we want, whenever we want. I mean, yeah. that's crazy, right? So that's when I said, okay, we're, we're taking this thing to another level. And that's when I started to put together this whole the idea of like getting everybody to eat with the seasons completely for free. We put out these packets. You were so generous to offer your recipes. I can't even tell you how generous it is for Very Emma to good. put her recipes on. She's not charging us anything. She's she gets it and it's all about just getting people to change their world and get reconnected and then and then when we start eating in the seeds we get these microbes we eat these plants we get these microbes it changes our microbiome so in the summer we have microbes that keep us cool in the winter we have microbes that help us digest bark or heavy heart to digest things and keep us warm in the spring we have different microbes that keep us from getting congested and allergies and things like that that's how it works and we are completely disconnected from that and we need to reconnect and of course you know cooking is like a huge part of it because that's how you can avoid processed foods which bugs won't eat right yeah so it's all yeah. about so it's all about your microbes you know we, and we think about it for a second how many things on your counter don't go bad ever you know like yeah. like bread used to go bad like 24 hours now it can stay on the counter soft and gushy for like a month and milk yeah. can stay in your refrigerator for six weeks and and then it's even scary to think about what's in the back of your refrigerator has been in there for who knows how long or in your pantry like the bugs won't eat it and you're 90 percent bug then you what should we be eating it because when you really think about that that it, that most of the stuff that we eat it doesn't really go bad we figure yeah. out a way for it not and, and that's not natural really is it no so it's sort of a like wow really and it's hard to to not eat a lot of those stored, you know, grains and then you're in your cupboard and things that and, and things that have been processed. But, you know, we have to start, you know, 
you know, making a case of how important it is to, to spend the time to cook. And that's why I love our relationship, because you can teach our, our listeners how to do it gracefully, easily, how to take advantage of their, their local farmers markets and CSAs and things like that, which is going to be great. I love hearing that dirt is good for you because the farmers that I get food from are always telling me like, you know, don't, don't take the dirt off your carrots, just scrub it and go ahead and eat it because all the good microbes are on the outside of the vegetable. And it, I mean, if you get rid of all of that, you know, if they're growing it in soil that doesn't have pesticides and contamination, then that's actually better for you. And I think there was an article that came out recently in the Times where they were actually recommending that having, I think it was a Michael Pollan article where eating small amounts of dirt was good for you. Um, <laughs> but it also makes me think of, I don't know what your thoughts are on fermented food, but those feed off of microbes in the air. And do, I guess what I'm wondering is, do the microbes in the air also change seasonally? So for example, if we're making sauerkraut or like an apple cider vinegar, something that feeds off of bacteria in our natural environment, does that also help keep our immune system boosted because it's the microbes that are surrounding us at that time of year? Well, you got to remember fermented foods originally were, were you know, kind of a human invention to help preserve mm -hmm. foods for the winter. There's, yeah. no, there's no need to ferment foods in the summer when you have plenty of food. Generally, you can just walk around, dig, hunt, gather, things like that. But in the winter, it was really hard for our ancestors to survive. So they figured out a way to ferment foods. And, and that was done with a, a lacto uh, acid fermentation process. And, mm -hmm. and um, the, the lactic acid is acid. It's very hot. So it heats the body up. And so we have to be careful not to do too much of the fermented foods in the summertime particularly because it's hot out and you're eating hot, you know, you know, acidic type of food. So you have to be careful to do more of it in the winter and less of it in the summer. Of course, we overlay that on top of your body type, which is, if, you know, Ayurveda, we, we sort of body type everybody. Some people are, have winter properties. They're cold all the time. Mm -hmm. Some people are hot all the time, like summer. And if you have a lot of natural heat in your body and you're in the summertime and you're eating spicy food and lots of fermented food, you could get rashes and skin rashes and inflame and get angry, throw pots and pans. Mm -hmm. And you're wondering like, what's going on with me? Well, you stacked all this heat in your body and that's a good reason for us to think about eating what nature is harvesting in that season, back to the seasons, which is yeah. cooling fruits and vegetables. So, so but, in small amounts, in, in, in condiment quantities, fermented foods are fantastic. Instead of eating, drinking yeah. a 20 ounce jar of kombucha, which is very acidic in the summertime, and you're a hot person, that could be a problem. But a small amount of that, a small amount of fermented foods you know, with your meal is a great thing. In the winter, more important. And of course, these, these, uh, the, the fermentation process is a great way to create more good probiotics. What's really interesting that you mentioned is that the, 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 the fruits, like the carrots, they mm -hmm. have skin. And the microbes live on the skin. And, and you, when you wash them, you get rid of the microbes. So we don't want to do that too much. If it's organic, yeah. you know, it's like I eat, just eat it. You know, I'm not going to, I might rinse it a little bit, but I'm not going to scrub anything yeah. if it's organic. And um, so the same thing happens to us is this, this, the microbes live on our skin, our respiratory skin, our intestinal skin, and maybe mm -hmm. in our urinary skin a little bit as well. But for the most part, it's our skin. Now, here's an interesting thought. Our skin in our intestinal tract is still on the outside of our body. Our mm -hmm. skin on our respiratory tract is still on the outside of our body. It doesn't become us until our respiratory skin or our intestinal skin decide that it's okay for that food or whatever to move into the body. Be absorbed. Right. So here's what we know. The bugs live on your skin and the bugs are totally sensitive to the environment there's all these studies that I'm writing about recently about how this, our, our bugs connect to the circadian rhythms. And if you're tied to the rhythms of nature, the cycles, the intestinal bugs get connected to that. They send messages to your brain that make, make you sleepy at the right time, tired at the right time, hungry at the right wow. time. That's how it all works. And it also, that's, those bugs on the skin are super sensitive to stress. I, ran, I found one study, you're not gonna even believe this, I found one study that showed that if a, a squirrel was basically sitting there and it was going to be eaten by a fox that when the squirrel would get worried and knew it was going to get eaten, 
that it would create such a level of fear that it would penetrate the earth and the microbes in the ground under the feet of the squirrel would dramatically change from that fear. Wow. Right? So That's fascinating. And those are the same bugs that you eat when you eat the plant that become our microbiome. And we know for a fact that when you are stressed out, your good bugs go south and your bad bugs proliferate like crazy. So mm -hmm. here all of a sudden we're like, wow, our circadian rhythms are connected to these cycles of nature. Our emotions impact our ability to digest and create a good, healthy microbiome. All of a sudden, yeah. the subtle stuff is becoming the most powerful stuff. It's really kind of interesting. That's fascinating. Well, one of the, I mean, so actually one of our readers asked, they were reading one of the recipes that we did for the three season diet challenge. And they asked, well, isn't this, you know, if you're eating according to Ayurvedic principles, don't you want to eat in, you know, in tune with your dosha, like vata or pita or, and so how does, you know, eating with the seasons and a three season diet fit in with that? I mean, it sounds like the focus is more on eating seasonally and really capturing what nature has to offer in the spring, fall, summer, and then you know fall goes into winter, as opposed to really focusing on, focusing on your dosha. Is that true? It's true. And what happens is in nature, we all are connected to the cycles of nature. You know, there's mm -hmm. you know different harvests in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, and we all are connected to that. And then what you do is you overlay on top of the seasons your individual constitution, your individual nature, which has a lot to do with, in a way, our ethnicity. You know, so you mm -hmm. want to overlay your unique individual differences. It might be an ethnic thing, might be just a genetic thing. You know, if you have a lot of fire and heat in your summer and your body type, a pitta body type, then you know that summer is your time of the year to really eat the cooling foods and not eat barbecues and spicy foods and heavy foods. Um, because it'll overheat you and create more problems. So, so that's how it works. Everybody changes with the season, and that actually is the original Ayurvedic application. In the West, what's happened is because the whole body type questionnaire was such a cool, juicy thing, great for sidebars and magazines and things, <laughs> Everybody started saying, oh, I'm a vata, so I do vata this, vata that, vata this, vata tea, vata food, vata everything. And the reality is that's an oversimplification of it. The reality is we connect to nature first. Ayurveda is a study of nature. It's about connecting to nature. And then from there, yeah. from there, we then say, oh, I'm super cold all the time. So winter is a cold time of the year. And nature in the winter is harvesting soups and stews and squirrels eat nuts mm -hmm. and seeds to insulate and warm us up. So that's the time I got to really be you know, focus on that type of a diet, maybe even start that warming diet, winter diet early, and maybe finish it a little bit late, like here we are now in March. So maybe a lot of people with more vata, they want to continue eating winter right through March and into April, For people mm -hmm. who are really hot and fiery, they're like done, they're already sweating because it's 40 degrees out, you know what I mean? So individually, we would make this transition based on what nature is doing and also what our nature is doing. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. And it also sounds like, you know, there's this kind of physical well-being that we have from eating seasonally, but also it brings us into rhythm with the place that we're living in and those seasons specifically and also the people around us. I mean, growing up, you know, we ate out of, my mom is a huge gardener, total green thumb, and we ate out of her garden all the time. And dinner time was the most important meal, and it was very reflective of what was coming out of the garden and representative of our culture, which is Italian and British, and um, sort of the nature of everyone in the family. So it ties you not only to yourself by eating that way, but to the people around you and the land that you're living on. So give me an example of what a, what a, a, a winter meal would have been like, you know, in the Frisch household. Yeah, winter. Well, Frisch is my, my Amazing, married right? name, okay. but right. it means fresh in German, so okay. I love it. We'll stick with it. Um, in the Kerwin household, it would have been, in the winter, probably a big, like, minestrone soup with vegetables that were frozen from the garden, and probably some, like, some pasta or beans probably in the soup, um, lots of spices, like cinnamon, cayenne, um, cumin, coriander, usually toasted and ground, garlic, um, fresh or well dried herbs. My mom hangs like bundles of herbs all up in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, onion, carrot, celeriac, you know, like root vegetables. So a hodgepodge of root vegetables and 
Um, maybe some protein in there too, like a little bit of chicken or beef. Yeah. And then big crusty loaf to dunk in. And my mom always puts the Parmesan rinds in the soup so that adds some flavor and usually grating a little bit of Parmesan and a drizzle of olive oil on top. Mm. You know, I, I did this thing last year on cheese and we found one study that showed that the, that I think it was as much as, this is crazy, right? But 80% of the microbes in the cheese come from the hands of the cheese maker. Wow. And, it, and <laughs> so much of that is on the rind. And uh, so when you throw those rinds in the soup, you're, you're just exploding it with whoever the cheesemaker was, better hope he was happy. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so glad I know some of my cheesemakers. Yeah, right. Well, that's, <laughs> that's such an Ayurvedic concept too, was to you know, make sure that whoever cooked the food and whoever grew the food and carried it to the market, they were all you know, being you know, paid for, paid you know, properly and cared for, and everybody was happy. And it was, there was a certain level of energy in the food that um, is sort of blissful. I mean, that sounds yeah. like completely crazy, but we have science now to prove the fact that if you're like throwing the food down and yelling and screaming at your partner while you're doing it, those bugs freak out. There's one study that said they took a container of yogurt, they put it on a counter and they yelled and screamed and the bugs in the yogurt container were dramatically shifted by the stress. So, so it's a whole different way of looking at our world, our digestion, uh, our microbiome, which makes our body healthy or not healthy, is yeah. determined on you know our emotions and how we relate to our food. Sit down, relax, take time, cook it in a in a beautiful, joyful way as you do. These are the things that I uh, I hope our readers, our listeners will will really learn from you. Of how hopefully it's easy to cook, um, and um, and. Uh, and, and start to get their fingers back into the kitchen and, and put their love back into that food because it is now not some weird thing, energy, your food. Yeah. It's a science now. Okay, you have got to send me these studies because I, twice now, I've given guest lectures at different universities and I've said, you know, I talk about different strategies for seasonal eating and how to source food and, and I've said, and you know, when you know the person who's growing your food or making your bread, there's just this like feel good factor and you're healthier and you feel better and there's this love that's put into it. And, and both times the professors have said like, oh, I don't you know, like you can't really make that kind of statement to a college class because like where is the evidence? So I love hearing that there's evidence and it definitely, I mean, in the, in the Frisch household here in Ithaca, ev almost everything on our table I can name who it came from. And I live in a place where we are so blessed with farming and food makers, but it, it just changes the reality of how you feel when you eat and um, the quality of the food. It's just, you know, it's like your best friend showing up with a plate of brownies, except every night when you're getting your vegetables that way. Wow. So wow. that is ideal. And you, you know, I think everybody can learn from you how to kind of replicate that in their own world because it's probably not. I think it's a pretty special place, I know. But yeah, those studies, I mean, I, I write about that on my blog every, you know, three times a week. I'm constantly writing about that. There's a whole section on microbiome in my blog and a whole section, you can, everybody can go Great. and read them. Some of these, you know, the, the, the relationship to the microbes and stress I've written about, but I'm, that's like my passion is proving the ancient wisdom with modern yeah. science. And that's what Ayurveda was. They were all about relaxing, being what's called sattvic and loving and caring. And now we know that that makes a huge impact on your microbiome, which is the most of us. So, so yeah, I'll send you some stuff, but definitely the new stuff just keeps coming. As I, as I get it, I write blogs about it because I just like, if I don't write, write about it right away, I forget it, right? Yeah. So, so I, I, I lock it in as soon as I find those studies. Um, All right, well, let's make a mental note to insert a little link at the bottom uh, right here that goes straight to your blog. So, all right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, let's see. So one of my first questions when I picked up a copy of your book was why three seasons? Yeah, well, you know, it's a great question. There's, there are obviously four seasons, we all know, but there are three major growing seasons. There's a spring growing mm -hmm. season, a summer growing season, and there's an end of summer sort of growing season and harvest which we then eat, you know, the root vegetables that can last and store, the nuts and seeds that can last and store, the grains that can last and store. Those are end of summer foods. Then we have the summer harvest, which is all the fruits and vegetables. Then we have the spring harvest, the, the root vegetables, the burdock root and, and the sprouts and the microgreens and the, and the early spring greens. 
those are all in spring. So we have three mm -hmm. distinct growing seasons. One season always takes a rest. Nature needs a rest too. Everybody needs a vacation. Nature takes a rest and it's dormant at that time. So when we really interact with nature, we're, acting, we're interacting for the most part with three major growing seasons. And that's why we call it the three season diet. And they happen to relate to the three basic principles in nature in Ayurveda, which are winter or vata, pitta or summer, or kapha and spring. And those are the three sort of governing principles of nature. Winter cold and dry and it controls your nervous system, makes people think really fast or forget really fast. Pitta being fire and competitive and driven and, and, and makes you overheat but also keeps your digestion strong. And kapha is that easy going mellow sort of spring quality which is earthy mm -hmm. and more watery and that creates calm but also some congestion as well. So those are the three principles and they appear in, in the three times of the year we interact with nature, taking the foods out of the ground. So it's a beautiful, uh, logical understanding of, of how we connect up with nature. And, uh, and we do that, our, our, our you know, uh, antenna, the conduit between us and nature is our microbes and they mm -hmm. change dramatically with the seasons. And that's why we're having this discussion about seasonal eating. So what are some of the, um, can you explain what nature's harvest in the spring is trying to accomplish in terms of microbes and? Well, in the springtime, it's a, you know, think about deer for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Deer in the winter, after the winter in the ground, the ground begins to soften, they're going to dig up the root vegetables, the root vegetables like burdock root, dandelion root, Oregon yeah. grape, golden seal, turmeric, ginger. They're going to dig up these rhizomes, which are surface roots, and they're going to, and they're going to eat them. And those rhizomes are very bitter, and they're going to scrub, and they're going to clean all the yuck and the mucus and all the heavy congestion from winter, all the holiday food, off the intestinal villi. So the, and, and, you know, 100 years ago, everybody in America drank dandelion root tea or burdock root tea, and they would throw it when they could in the winter, throw it in their soups and stews. And, and mm -hmm. as we transition now from winter into spring, that's what sustained us because there was nothing coming out of the ground yet. It was those bitter roots that, that really kept us going. And then the microgreens come out of the ground and the sprouts, which are sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, 20 to 30 to 400 times more potent. So as nature starts trying to get some food for us, nature says, okay, I know you've been starving. All your winter food's gone. We're going to give you some sprouts that just so happen to have 400 times the nutritional value. So I know you're yeah, starving. Well. So we're going to help you out here a little bit and give you some super food here real early on. And then the plants grow up and we have a more, a much more abundant food later on and that and those microgreens are loaded with chlorophyll and they fertilize the villi with good bacteria and that's how we restart our microbiome every season is nature's new every spring is nature's new year so we restart we have a chance this spring to restart the whole thing if we do it properly and then the last piece yeah. of spring's puzzle is the 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 uh, and this is interesting because a lot of people think berries are only harvested in the in the fall, but we hybridize so much of our foods to be grown when we want them to be grown. But originally, some of those berries were in the spring as well. And those very bitter berries were, were mm -hmm. powerful uh, lymph movers. They have lots of anthracidins and polyphenols that flush your lymphatic system. And uh, around your intestinal tract, like that, around it is your lymphatic system, which controls your entire immune system, drains your cells, supports your, your, your any hypersensitivity reactions. That lymph is such an important part. And the berries and the cherries of spring flush the lymph. So nature in the spring said we're going to we're going to clean the villi with the roots, we're going to fertilize it with the greens, then we're going to flush the lymph with the berries, and now we're set for summer. So that's, that's, the, uh -huh. that's nature's springtime plan. So now I'm curious how you would then say, okay, that's the plan. How are we going to make that happen with like a CSA or, or a farmer's market? What would you do? That's a great question. So spring is one of those tricky times of year because it's when you know, the CSAs are dried up from the summer. And some places, but very few, have winter CSAs, and those are dried up. And so it's really, the spring is really about making friends with your grocery store manager and learning how to figure out what foods in the produce section are to fit into this spring diet that you're talking about. So bitter greens like arugula, microgreens, burdock root is great, dandelion leaves. A lot of grocery stores don't carry this stuff, so... I mean, seriously, the, the produce manager can be your friend. Like, he's usually someone who's out on the floor, but 
they buy food based on what customers want. So if you say, hey, like, do you have dandelion root? I don't see it. He could say, no, but we'll get this in next week for you. And trying to get a sense of what is coming in seasonally because they also order based on seasonal produce lists. So that's one way. Um, also, I wanted to add before just when we were talking about like what, you know, organic versus non-organic foods and what is technically considered clean or dirty and what you can just eat without peeling. There's a great list online by the Environmental Working Group and they actually list all their all, all produce by like the dirtiest and the cleanest. So it's a great shopping guide if you want to be really careful about what you're picking up at the store. So, um, so spring, make friends with your grocery store manager. Try to find a spring CSA if you can. They're not you know, they're starting to come, um, they're starting to be more available, but it's still really difficult in a lot of parts of the country to grow in the spring, at least the Northern Hemisphere, and I happen to be there. In the South, there should definitely be spring CSAs that you can tap into, and even farmer's markets, when they get started early, hit them up because they'll have things like Jerusalem artichokes and burdock root and, and spring microgreens. And then also, you can... can you can cut out your own beans at home. And that's something that we always, we do that a little bit throughout the winter, but we really try to ramp that up in the summer. And it kind of taps in with this feeling of just sprouting out in the springtime and capturing those, that energy that comes that you're just describing with that when, you know, a vegetable or a seed wants to sprout um, and really put forth its roots. So those would be my top recommendations. And I'm Totally interested in hearing other thoughts that you have as well. Well, one thing, like you said, about sprouting your, your beans, which is great, because in the winter, you want more acidic foods because they're warmer. And the more acidic a food, the more it penetrates in stores, like nuts and seeds store. You always think of acid foods as terrible and bad for you, but they're actually not. They're a part of nature. The brown foods are for winter to store and penetrate and rebuild the nervous system with proteins and fats. So a bean, for example, in the winter would be very acidic. But then when mm -hmm. spring comes, the rules change. We want to start going to alkalize the body to flush the lymphatic system to help the body naturally detoxify. So you take that same bean, which is acidic in the winter, and you sprout it in the spring, and now it's, now it's extremely alkaline for us, not to mention all the super nutrients we get from that. Um, it's, so it's just beautiful an understanding, and that's sort of very natural. What would happen is that the animals would eat the sprouts, as soon as they sprouted, they were going to gobble them up or we were going to pick them because yeah. they were so juicy and so nutritious for us. So that's an important thing. Plus also, you know, with what Ayurveda did, which I think is really neat, is they said, okay, we're going to take foods from around the world and we're going to classify them into the qualities that are required in the spring and the summer and the winter. So in the winter time, when it's cold outside, you can't find any avocados but they are heavy and 85% fat. So you can import them from Florida or California and have them in your winter diet, even though they're not local. So it mm -hmm. gives us a little bit of a wider range of foods that we can eat. So we're not only eating local, which can be a little austere for folks. So it gives us a little bit yeah. of a wider berth, but still allowing us to have the benefits. Like apples, for example, even though we know apples are harvested in the fall kind of thing, they actually have properties that actually make them quite good in the springtime as well. So, um, so that's kind of what's nice about the Ayurvedic. They classify these foods, so it allows us to have a little bit of that luxury of eating some foods that might be not quite in season or not quite geographically local, but they actually are, are available for us. Ideally, the main emphasis should be seasonal, the very best we can, because that's where we get our microbes. But there, there's two things happening. One is the microbe thing, and the other thing's happening is the quality thing. Nuts and seeds and fats are important in the wintertime. Yeah. Alkaline foods and cleansing foods are important in the springtime. So we want to get those biochemical factors, plus the local stuff gets us the local microbe factor. So there's kind of two things, probably a lot more than two things actually going on, but that's all I know. Well, that's, I mean... It's great to hear that the focus is seasonal eating, and yes, your natural constitution, but not as much of an emphasis on dosha first. It's season first, and then that you can incorporate these other foods from different places, because I do think, you know, when people start to think about eating healthier or how to change your diet, they often get confused or feel like there's too much to take on, but it's actually a pretty easy approach. It's saying there's these categories. Within that, you can make you know, whatever you want. There's a few guidelines to follow, but it doesn't have to be super nitpicky. It's sort of getting in tune with this natural rhythm. And um, 
I think, you know, with the locavore thing, it can be very austere and sort of put people off and like, ah, I have to give up chocolate. Like I'm definitely never giving up chocolate. Mm -hmm. So just being aware of the quality of where the food's coming from and how you're incorporating it is, is key. Yeah. So, so feeding into off of spring, we're sort of cleansing and, and getting rid of that heat. Then what does summer bring us? What does that do for our bodies? Well, after you, you know, clean and get the body prepared for summer, summer is warmer. And it's again, another alkaline season um, because the alkaline keeps the body flushing and therefore allows us to stay cool. One mm -hmm. of the most important parts of why we're here and the Neanderthals aren't is because we had the ability to dissipate heat better than our kind of ice age northern European ancestors. And as a result, we were going to persistence hunting in Africa for an extra couple hundred thousand years before we left Africa and we came, we could outrun them and the ice age was ending. So it was like a perfect time for us to thrive and we did. And so we have all these things that happen to us to help dissipate heat. And one of them is that nature's growing food and heating it up and cooking it <laughs> on the vine as opposed to in our stomach. In the winter, we have better digestion to digest meats and wheat and corn, maybe not corn, corn's a whole special thing, but, but you know, grains and things like that. But we have all this extra digestive fire. So we have heat the body up in the winter, we want that. But in the summertime, we want to mm -hmm. cool the body down because we don't want to get overheated. So all the cooling fruits and vegetables are there to keep us cool down. Now, if we don't get rid of the yucky, extra mucusy stuff in the spring, the summer will bake that mucoid material onto your intestinal tract, make your intestinal tract more compromised, more irritated, more dried out. And at the end of the summer, we have this thing called thermal accumulation where it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and the leaves turn mm -hmm. red, the leaves fall off the trees. So basically it's a, it's a kind of get rid of the heat, the leaves dry out. It's a, it's a kind of response to excess heat. We, that heat will rise inside of us. It'll cause us to dry out. And at the end of the summer, our sinuses begin to dry out. When they dry out, the mucous membranes become irritated by the pollens which are surging. And then we have allergies and sinus problems and things like that. And then, so we want to eat. So nature said, okay, we got that figured out. What we're going to do is we're going to give you the super cooling foods at the end of the summer, like pomegranate, super cooling, apples, super cooling, uh, watermelon, super cooling, to really help mm -hmm. cool the body down. And apples, for example, if you, I mean, you know, in, in Ithaca, New York, everybody, they have like Oktoberfest and everybody eats apple pie and drinks apple juice and applesauce and apple everything for in October, right? And everybody walks around with loose bowel movements during that time. <laughs> because when you, per Ayurveda, we know that to get heat out of your body, you create purgation. Like a baby gets a fever, they get mm -hmm. diarrhea. That helps get the heat out. That's why it happens. So nature said, I'm going to give you all these purgative foods at the end of the summer to flush the heat out of your system so you don't go into the winter, you know, hot and dry and summer yeah. is cold and dry so nature said I'm gonna get rid of the the heat with winter which is cold but the dryness accumulates and that makes our intestines dry our skin dry our sinuses dry and that's where all the bugs live and that's where our immunity lies and when that gets dried out and compromised so does our immunity and that's why we get sick and cold and flu season starts to happen yeah. and that's because we didn't follow the rules that nature was prescribing so interesting I love the concept of cooking on the vine and over the past couple summers I've done classes called cooking out of the CSA box and a lot of the recipes that we make have no cooking at all like we make um, you know a pappardella pasta which is basically shaved summer squash with tomato and basil and a little bit of olive oil and garlic so it's and it's kind of an imitation pasta and it's just using all this fresh abundance that we have without turning on the stove top and creating lots of heat. I mean, both in the kitchen and the air around you when you're already hot outside, but also in the food, which is just totally ready to eat off the vine. Yeah, I think that people, um, people didn't realize yeah. that the digestive fire is lower in the summer to help us not get overheated. And the foods are easier to digest, you know, in the summertime. And we ate more of those foods. We would, you know, but most of us are eating, you know, ice cream and burgers and fries and barbecue, everything, which is, you know, I mean, a little bit of that's fine. But if the emphasis is on the cooling foods, you know, what would that do to our, it would support the health of our microbiome. How would that do as we transition into winter? How would, how would that work? And I'm curious to know, like, 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 
how would you then recommend someone, you know, in terms of summer foods, like, you know, from the CSA, how would you, know, one not cooking them, but what else would you suggest for folks to do in that regard, to stay connected to the summer? Yeah, I mean, a lot of salads. Yeah. So one of the great things about the summer is that it's, it's easy to throw something together quickly. And um, salads, you can, you know, range beyond just greens. You can cook like some grains, for example, rice or lentils, and I don't know what you'd think about that in terms of summer food, but I like to mix that with cucumbers, tomatoes, whatever is coming in off of, off of the vine, but also quickly cooking foods, so not really spending a lot of time cooking something to death. And for example, like squash blossoms are a great example of that because they're these flowers that come off of a summer squash vine. They're beautiful. They're wide open in the morning. So you want to get them early at the farmer's market or if you garden or have a friend who does, pick them off their vine. And you can just stuff it with a little bit of goat cheese. Um, you could chop some tomatoes, whatever, really whatever you have, stuff it up. And then you just throw it on a skillet with a little bit of ghee for a little bit of time just so that it wilts and then you eat it. It's, it just doesn't require a lot of cooking. Um, yeah. Well, I was, I was, we were in Europe last year. We were doing this research on farmers and we were in the very outback skillet getting cheese and from these local farmers. And the, the wildflowers blew my mind. And I was like, there were so many of them everywhere. I was like, there's no way. And then we went to these restaurants and they were, and every dish had flowers all over them. We were eating flowers for breakfast, lunch, and supper. So I'm just That's curious, what, and of course, their summer, can you tell us, share with us anything about flowers and what are edible and what are not edible and what are safe to eat? And is there any roadmap there? And do you know about any of the benefits of flowers? Yeah, well, so there's a lot of flowers that we can eat and I absolutely love eating flowers. I think it's one of the most beautiful things that you can put on your plate. And a lot of them are growing around us all the time. So for example, marigolds are edible, the petals, and they're also, they're insect repelling. So it's a great natural way of growing food and also keeping pests off of your food without spraying it with chemicals. If you eat those, will they keep them off of you too? I don't think so. Like, no, eating, but that's a good, I think that's gonna, <laughs> you do. I don't think so. I think that they kind of pull in whatever okay. whatever they have on them. I mean, nasturtiums, which are yeah. really spicy, almost like a radish, are just so delicious. And they're really easy to grow. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that they have, um, like, they probably help with the digestive system a little bit because they have that spicy, um, spicy but cooling quality of a radish. And I know that radish at least in Latin America, I lived there for four years and they always serve it as a garnish when it's in season with a little bit of lemon juice and tossed with cilantro and parsley. And it's thought to be a really good way to sort of cut fat and also aid digestion. Um, other flowers that you can eat, daylilies, you know, those orange flowers that grow in a lot of people's gardens. And, and I will say, actually, I'll preface this by saying that if you're eating anything wild, you should be 100% sure about it. You should find a mentor first or a guidebook and not just go out and eat people's flowers from their backyard because I said that they're good. Um, what else? Calendula petals are great. Rose. I make rose, like rosebud tea all the time. Yeah. Lavender. So there's a lot of flowers out there and I'm actually not sure what, you know, some of the scientific properties are, but I know that when they're in season and you pair them with another flavor ingredient that's also in season, it just really heightens the quality of the dish and makes it that much prettier. Well, get ready because we're going to do, in come summer, we're going to talk a lot about flowers and edible flowers as, as part of our seasonal eating plan. Great. So I'm going to dig up all the research on it and then you're going to make recipes for it and we're going to rock. Okay? Perfect. Sound Perfect. Good? That's going to be awesome. Good. Good. Definitely. Good. 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 Yeah, so, all right, so spring and summer we've got down, so winter, what is nature trying to accomplish there? Well, we all know squirrels eat nuts and seeds in the winter, and, and winter's cold and dry, so nature says, okay, I'm going to help you out here by giving you a lot of warmer foods that have been cooked all summer long and become more and more dense, right? Because it takes a long time to create a dense food that's not going to rot 
or break down and last you through the winter. That's what nature's trying to do, right? Like a squash or a pumpkin. Yeah, or nuts or seeds or even the grains. Yeah. Even the grains, even though they're small, they're very hard. So they'll last yeah. for us. So, so nuts and seeds, basically a higher protein, higher fat diet. As we talked about, it's the acid time of the year. You know, we've always heard that we should eat two thirds of our diet alkaline, one third acid. Well, if you actually did it only by nature, you would have, you know, spring and summer alkaline and winter would be acid. And that would be one third of the harvest is mostly acid and two thirds spring and summer is mostly alkaline. So instead of getting, you know, our, our RDA every single day of the year, the certain amount of protein and fats and carbohydrates and certain amount of acid and alkaline food every day, Nature did it in an annual cycle, not a daily cycle. It's impossible to do it in a daily cycle. So we're looking at trying to make bigger shifts in our diet as opposed to daily shifts in our diet. You know what I mean? So emphasizing mm -hmm. more protein and more fat. And if, you eat, if you're not a vegetarian, um, then eat more meat and more protein. And if you're a vegetarian, you've got to really find those protein sources in the wintertime. Yeah. Find that good fat in the wintertime to help insulate yourself. And thank God cholesterol has been taken off the nutrient concern list, which has been on for 60 years. And that means that when that officially happens sometime this month, the FDA is going to put out a report uh, taking it off the nutrient concern list. That means cholesterol is not going to be like zero cholesterol on your foods. They're going to change the school lunch menus. Everything on, in our world about fat is going to change because that's wow. been taken off the nutrient concern list. So good fats are going to be back for us. Um, and we'll see if they get it right this time. Uh, but yeah. they'll be back. And, and so that's the plan in the winter is to insulate and, and store those proteins and fats. And, and, um, yeah. and that is an interesting season for us to feed and, and eat from. So I'm curious, you know, how would you then guide someone to get, to get that kind of, uh, you know, biochemical input seasonally in the winter? Yeah, so in the winter, it's all about building off of what you had from the summer, right? And so, or from the fall, really, from, there's this just really unique time of year, and usually it's around October, where you have tomatoes and pumpkins and salad greens and kale, like this, it's kind of the gamut of what the summer offered into the fall, and um, one of the, I, I, I'll just touch quickly on um, good ways to source in the summer. Again, it's going back to farmer's markets, CSAs. There's some really great websites for picking your own food as well, pickyourown.org. So you can go you know, to berry farms and orchards and load up. Localharvest.org is also the best database for finding all of these different places in your neighborhood. And again, don't underestimate your grocery store, especially as more and more people are starting to become aware of, of eating seasonally and really trying to stock up for um, it's like based on what's available locally as well. But um, in the winter, we touch on preservation a little bit, but the focus there is to start to put up your food. So making a lot of preserves and ferments is something that I do. And, you know, that includes, I mean, if I tilt my screen, you can see I have several jars up on the top of my cabinets up there. Um, we put up applesauce with cinnamon and tomato sauce with lots of spices. We usually have a big bowl of, of um, fall squash, butternut squash, carnival squash, pumpkins on our kitchen table, potatoes, root vegetables like beets and carrots. All that stuff keeps really well in the refrigerator, just in the bottom drawers. So stocking up on those foods that, that last longer. Um, but really making sure that your pantry is powered, like have things you know, in the freezer. I usually buy as much kale and chard as I can from farmer's markets or my CSA at the end of the fall, and then I'll freeze it. And an easy way to freeze it is you can blanch the greens, which is just dunking the, let's go with kale, for example. You just dunk it in a big pot of boiling water, squeeze out the water, and then roll the greens into a burrito and plastic wrap and stick it in the freezer. And then you have that during the winter to add to soups or cook in something that's a little bit hardier. Um, it's also usually when we get a meat CSA, so we will often split an animal with like several other families. So you can buy into like a pig or a cow and get a certain amount of cuts of meat and put it in the freezer and then you can sort of whittle away at that, you know, as you want over the winter. Um, so that's, those are some of my strategies. There's lots of, I'm really into quick pickles. If you're you know, lacto-fermenting pickles,
cycles by doing it naturally on the counter can be scary if you're just getting into fermentation so there's I have quick pickle recipes on my blog for just making them and then putting them in the refrigerator to ferment um, we do that with beets all sorts of different vegetables Wow. So doesn't it just make everybody just want to move in and have a meal in, in, in the <laughs> kitchen right there we're sitting in the background. So like, I want you to cook me a meal. And actually it makes me think you know, that Emma does do that actually. She has a, a incredible uh, program that um, she has where she has these, these tents where people can come and sleep in these tents and live in these tents. And, um, and she feeds them with her organic locally grown foods that are um, just so incredibly good for you. So imagine living you know, in a tent connected to the rhythms of nature, going to bed with the sun, up with the sun, and getting fed with foods that are completely locally grown, getting all those good microbes, getting foods that are, that are cooked from Emma in a way that uh, is so, so much love and so much care into all those foods. So I, I just think, you know, that is such a brilliant idea in my mind for so many reasons other than just going camping and having good food. It's, you know, going in this beautiful tent, living in nature, connecting with your rhythms, reconnecting your cycles of nature. There was a study that showed that, that humans have what are what's called gene noise, which means that our genes have gotten so stressed out, so disconnected from the cycles of nature that our, literally our own genes cannot hear the circadian rhythms. So I was like, what? Are you kidding me? So what better way to reconnect your genes with the circadian rhythms than actually to, to live close to the earth, with, you know, connected to the rhythms and the circadian rhythms, eat foods that come from that local ground, and then, um, and then support and reset yourself. And that's what Emma does uh, with her, her camps. And I want you to, her firelight camps are called, and please, Emma, tell us a little bit about that because it's just, just, I just think it's such a brilliant idea. I love, love learning about that. And that was getting people back to nature and closer to nature was the motivation behind starting Firelight Camps. And it's a glamorous camping hotel so that my husband and I own. And it's, they're basically these beautiful canvas safari tents built on platforms right in the woods. Um, our first location is in Ithaca, New York, and we're on the trailhead of a big state park. So you can walk out of your tent and walk right down to all these beautiful waterfalls and lakes. And you're you know, kind of in this place where you're not sacrificing comforts and modern amenities. You have a real bed with a real comforter and real bathroom with flushing toilet. But you're sleeping under canvas and you can hear the birds and when you walk up to the lobby it's also a big tent and there's campfires going all the time so one of our you know our favorite things is to just at sundown spark the fire we have a wine hour with all Finger Lakes wines and just sit around the fire and experience this quintessential campfire moment where people who don't know each other take a moment to pause and connect and tell stories and um, I think in like the first 60 nights that we opened, we saw one person on their computer and it was a 16-year-old boy playing video games. But otherwise, people didn't even think of getting on their phone. Like it was, you know, it felt sacrilegious to do that in this beautiful setting. Wow. So that's what Firelight Camps is about. And then on the food side, everyone who stays there wakes up to a complimentary breakfast. And the breakfast is meant to be like a real taste of the place you're staying in. So it's this beautiful spread of artisanal breads and preserves and granola and seasonal fruit and different savory and sweet pastries. Um, some of the stuff I make, but a lot of it I, I kind of curate from different producers in our region. And then we add in some other food events, a lot of cooking over fire, so campfire food, really coming back to those primitive roots. And if you want to really dive into the forest, you can go on a wild edible hike and see what it's like to eat out of the woods behind your tent. So that's what we're doing at Firelight Camp. So we'd love to have you come stay. Wow, that's incredible. And I, you know, I think that, you know, the more people realize how important it is to reconnect with those rhythms, the more these camps are going to become a requirement for people to get connected. You know, local food, yeah. connect with the rhythms. And just camping in general is good. But then we all go and you get, you know, Velveeta cheese from the local place because where you go camping, they don't sell anything good, you know. And that's sort of always the bummer, right? You have to pack in some. It's just hard to 
I find camping to get good food, like not like what you're talking about. This is like a dream come true to actually be able to really eat local food, get those good bugs. You feel really good, and then or be you know you know not worry about snakes. There's no snakes that can get through those tents, right? Maybe just nah, not through the tents. Definitely okay. not. Maybe okay, like yeah. on the trails, nothing. Oh, that's okay. I just don't want any snakes crawling in <laughs> bed. You know? Snake phobia, huh? Yeah. Well, well you can even. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, spiders and snakes, you know, I want to make sure that they're not in my bed. But if that's no. good, as long as we have a snake free environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's snake we're, free. We're good then. Yeah. It's snake free, but not s'more free. <laughs> and you can feel good about the s'mores too. We make, I make all the graham crackers from scratch with flour that's grown right here good. and marshmallows with different, you know, herbs and, and seasonal flavors. So you can have a lemon custard marshmallow and rosemary graham cracker. Wow. Wow. That sounds great. So, all right, my husband and I have been obsessed with this show called Game of Thrones that you may have heard of. And the motto that they keep saying in it is winter is coming. And all I can think of is spring is coming because it's been 40 degrees here and sunny and everything's melting. And this is usually the time of year that I like to do a cleanse. And I would love to hear about the Colorado cleanse, which is this incredible package that you've created over 14 days to really kick our system back into gear and, and get us ready for the summer. Well, you know, uh, you know, in nature, as we talked about, nature is making, you know, every effort in the world to get us those bitter roots to clean the villi and greens to fertilize and the lymphatic cleansing. And, and over time, because we haven't done that, not only is our ability to support microbiology been compromised, but in, in a very direct way, that causes a lot of kind of dialing down of our digestive strength. So then we mm -hmm. eat foods and we're exposed to toxins. I mean, even I mean, our, t our world has become so toxic that even eating organic vegetables, you're still getting mercury from the coal mine plumes that you can't wash off. So we still have to eat mercury. And we, but if you're healthy and you have a good digestive system, you can process and detoxify that. So most people think we can just avoid mercury altogether. We can't. But if you don't digest well, you don't digest wheat and dairy well, or hard to digest foods well, and you notice your digestion is not as strong as it once was, then you want to say, boy, before you just go and cleanse out the body, you want to make sure that there's a reason why the body put the toxins in your fat in the first place. And that's because it didn't know what to do with them. So first what we do is we reset digestive function so you become a better digester. Then we reset your ability to detoxify well. So then we go in there and chelate the impurities out of the fat cells and then flush them out of your system. And we leave you in a place where you're able to digest harder to digest who's better. We leave you in a place where you're not craving a whole bunch of stuff you know, as you once did. And we also leave you in a way where you can de detoxify on your own better. And of course, mm -hmm. along the way, people lose, you know, generally on average seven to 17 pounds. They feel better. They don't crave stuff when they leave. So there's lots of incredible benefits from the point of view of actually resetting, you know, digestive detox function and then detoxifying. And the springtime is just a fantastic time to do it. And we do this Colorado cleanse as a group twice a year. And you can do it anytime you want as part of our anytime cleanse. That's completely fine. But twice a year, we do it as a group. We have like sometimes five to 800 people doing it together. And we have, we have online uh, forums where you can communicate with other cleansers. There's, um, there's emails you get every morning. There's lectures by me, question and answer sessions by me. There's all kinds of support to guide you through this process, which we're to hold your hand through the process. And, um, and that's what the Colorado Cleanse is about. And, uh, and like I said, you can do whatever you want, but twice a year we do it as this kind of group thing. But it's a great way in the, in the spring or the fall to actually really get the body to reset our digestive strength. And as we get older, you know, our digestive strength is sort of wanting to dial down. And, and I don't think that's necessary or required that as we get older, we have to digest less, eat, you know, a, a, a more restricted diet. I think we can digest well like an 18 year old well into our 50s and 60s and 70s and and that requires a little reconnecting to nature and that's what these this rest of these recipes that we give you during the cleanse and the herbs we give you during the cleanse are all about dialing up our digestive and detoxifying ability. That's great. So when's the next group cleanse? The next group cleanse starts in uh, April. It's the second and third week in April um, okay. or third and fourth week in April. So that's coming up really soon. And, and, and right now, as, as we, uh, as, so that comes up in April. So that's something that people can tune into and, and, uh, and check out on our so website. So now's probably a good time to check out the cleanse if people are thinking about doing it, you know, getting the ebook, reading up, and kind of 
getting their head into motion for April. Right, right. We sent, we have a little kit that concludes the book and 10 days, seven days of food comes with the kit, all the herbs you need. It's actually a really, really good deal. Um, awesome. And how to actually, you know, and t teaches you how to guide yourself through the cleanse. And uh, yeah, this is the time to start thinking about it. And most of us come springtime are, are sort of thinking about, you know, getting ready for, for, uh, for summer, getting ready to just feeling that the desire to eat less heavy food and start making that transition. So between the cleanse yeah. and our Eat With The Seasons Challenge, we're going to get people back on track. Well, that's great. I'll have to make sure I'm not at some food festival because it sounds like something that would be great for me in April. And how awesome to do it in solidarity with a lot of other people and really feel and, that support. And if people can't do it in April, you can always do it on your own whenever you want because we give you all yeah. kinds of you know, information how to do that. So, But just always think about how you can do something in the spring to, to prepare in a major way for because this is nature's new year. It's a great time to make, make that happen. Great. Well, there's a group here in Ithaca that does, we do cleanses together. So I'm really excited to share this with them. And maybe this awesome. will be the next one that we focus on. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, I might... It was such a pleasure to talk to you today. Yes. Thank you for all your wisdom and all your recipes and everything that you're doing for everyone and keeping us all connected to the seasons. And uh, I look forward to doing this again soon. Me too. Thank you for your wisdom and just this amazing partnership and definitely let's get some flower recipes on the menu this summer yeah absolutely okay thank you all right have a great Bye. day Bye. take care this recording is brought to you by life spa where ancient ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science get access to free health video newsletters by dr john at lifespa.com these statements have not been evaluated by the fda these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease